First Peter chapter five is powerful. It is a, uh, a, a small text, but it gives us some things that are inspiring. And, and what is it? Well, God uses chapter five to express to us this, the trusted eyewitnesses. God's trusted eyewitnesses are the ones that are delivering this message. And this is very powerful because so often we find ourselves in this uh, debate with the world, if you will, about the authors of the biblical text. And, and, and so often the atheists or the uh, uh, agnostic or the critic of the Bible say, oh, we have no idea who wrote this. This stuff was just all pulled together. These are random things, or this is a forgery. In First Peter and Second Peter, there are folks that make claims that it is a forgery. And they say, why? Well, the Greek's too good. Well, you get insights into First Peter chapter 5, that help you to understand some things about these trusted witnesses. Now, when I say these trusted witnesses, I'm not talking about the firsthand eyewitnesses to Jesus. I'm talking about the firsthand eyewitnesses to Peter. Now, you've got Peter, you've got the Apostle Paul, you've got a number of these eyewitnesses that are there, and it is very powerful how these figures are known throughout the New Testament text. And they name them periodically, which what does that mean? That means that when Peter or Paul or Luke or Mark or any of these individuals wrote in um, the Bible, wrote any of these texts, they're always associated with somebody. And in this particular uh, text, 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter uh, writes about this gentleman, Silas. He writes about him, and he writes about the elders who are receiving this. And this is powerful on a number of levels, because if I'm writing a letter, someone has to deliver it in the first century. It wasn't like you could put it in the mailbox and have it delivered. It wasn't like you could just write it and, and, and put it in an email, paste and copy it or copy and paste into an email that just didn't work that way. Well, how did they do it? Well, they did it through relationships. They had eyewitnesses to them who wrote these things, who traveled with Peter and Paul. And then what did they do? Well, then they delivered it. And when they delivered these things, it is powerful to see that these individuals were credible individuals. And that's 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 incredible in every way. So Let's jump on in here to 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And it says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who has also share, who will share in the glory to be revealed. Verse 1, he's beginning to open up this idea to these eyewitnesses, right? He is telling us, uh, hold on one second, let me fix the internet. Um, he is showing us here that, um, what do we see? That he was a fellow elder, fellow. He says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a what? Fellow elder. There was a group that served as elders in the first century church. These were individuals that were appointed as elders, as overseers of the church. And these were not all eyewitnesses to Jesus. Now, Peter was, right? Which is great. Uh, but he also worked in conjunction with other individuals in the first century. So when Peter is writing this letter, and he's assisted by a gentleman named Silas, which we'll get to, he's in cahoots or camaraderie with a group of other elders. So the thing you've got to understand here, when people want to say that, oh, these are forgeries, these are just somebody who who just happened to write this stuff and, and, and take on the name of Peter, that is ridiculous. It's ridiculous on a couple of levels. Well, number one, they would have to coordinate not just what they wrote in 1 Peter, but now they got to coordinate the book of Acts. They've got to coordinate 1 and 2 Timothy. They've got to coordinate... Uh, first and second Corinthians, all these things would have to be coordinated in such a way that they don't contradict each other in the names and places. And when you look at these texts, 
they mention the same names throughout different parts in the same capacity that they serve. And so you can't just write something and just send it out. And then that community is going to say, oh, yeah, that's it, without uh, um, often authenticated by whom? By those that they know. And so when he writes here in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, to the elders among you, I, I appeal as what? A fellow elder. They were, they were friends. The people he was writing to, they were all connected. These individuals that, that he's talking to were all eyewitnesses to whom? All the eyewitnesses. So it wasn't like Peter could just write or the naysayers would say it wasn't Peter. It was a fraud. Okay. A fraudulent person just couldn't write a text and then pass it on to a group of people and they would go, oh yeah, this is it. They, they authenticated texts. How did they authenticate it? Authenticate the text through relationships. And, and, and as Peter writes this, he says, I appeal as a fellow elder. Well, these people were all trusted. And to be an elder in the first century, it was the highest of character evaluations. You had to have a, a certain particular character in your life, and your family had to be a reflection of what God teaches a family should be, loving. Everyone is faithful in the family. You've managed your family well. You're loved and respected inside the church, and you are respected outside the church. So these are, these are individuals of great character. They have been uh, vetted. They have their, their, their uh, example has not been of a year or two years. It's the duration of their family's life, right? You evaluate them. Then there were folks within the church that had to evaluate them and say, yes, these are individuals of high caliber, faith, and character. Wow, both inside the church and outside the church. And these were individuals in this particular case that could authenticate. This is this is Peter, not just these are individuals of high character, but they knew him because he was in their circle as well. And these were eyewitnesses to the writers. So when someone comes to you and says, Oh, we don't know who this is a fraudulent writing, they're 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 just they have no evidence of that. They have zero evidence of that. And in Peter's case, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, the reason they say it's fraudulent is because the Greek is so written, written so well. That's really it. The Greek is written so well. And they go, a fisherman, a laborer like Peter probably didn't have the education to actually do that. And I agree. The problem is at the end of this letter, you know what he says? Silas, help me. Silas was someone who helped him write it. Why? He was more educated than Peter was. And I appreciate Peter being humble and vulnerable enough to say that. Unlike we are in our current day, we don't generally hold up that kind of humility where someone could say, hey, I'm I'm really bad. I'm uneducated on this writing skill. And so I need someone to help me write this. It's just, grab on to this, people. Understand that. Hey, if you're just joining me, I want to let you know we do this every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We jump into the word of God and we go verse by verse, line by line to help people to get a better grasp on the scriptures, a better understanding of the word of God so that it can transform your heart and mind, and you can live in such a way that pleases God. Kim, what's happening? Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Kim is always here lighting it up, giving great encouragement and faith. I so appreciate it. So let's go back. So, so what do we get? To the elders among you. So that helps you to understand his connection to these other individuals, and it also helps you to understand that these elders, that he's making his appeal to, these were the individuals that also passed this on to be copied. And that's why we have so many copies of the first century letters, because these individuals were connected to those that wrote them. They were eyewitnesses to those that wrote them. And so they copied them. They copied them what? For the distribution 
of all the faithful in the first century. Wow. So what a what a what a great way to pass on God's word. He says a witness. Now, now Peter now says, look, I'm a fellow elder, but as a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Look at what he says here, verse two, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. So he's talking to these individuals who are known as shepherds amongst who? God's flock. And this is powerful because this is the handing off of the testimony. This is where you see that you have Peter, who is an apostle, who is an elder, but he's also an eyewitness to Jesus. And what is Peter doing? Peter's saying, I'm telling you the teachings of God. I'm giving you what I got from Jesus as an eyewitness. And he says, I'm handing it off to you. And what does he want from them? He says, be the shepherd of God's flock. He says, I want you to be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. So you've got to understand him handing off this, this letter, him handing off this writing, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. He's handing it off to individuals that are what? Individuals that are going to be shepherds of God's people. So he's saying, look, you've got to care for them. The things that I'm teaching you, the things that I'm writing and instructing you with, I want you to turn around and do what? Be shepherds of God's flock that are under your care. And this is why we have so many copies. It was individuals like these elders who are not all named here that, that, that Peter entrusted his writings to, knowing that they would then in turn make sure that everyone heard the apostles' teaching. This is powerful, guys. And it's in this little verse right here, verses 1 and verses 2 of 1 Peter chapter 5. And that's that's something that, you know, in the world we live in today, you know, it's so corrupted, the world we live in. We, we, we find ourselves having such a difficult time trusting anyone on any level that, that we can't fathom that they're honest relationships like this. And the reason they had these relationships of high integrity, high trust, is first off, the eyewitnesses were chosen by God. The eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ, there were about 120. We read this in Acts chapter one. There were about 120, and they were with Jesus the whole time in his earthly ministry, all the way up to the resurrection. Peter says very clearly in Acts chapter 10, God didn't choose everyone. He only chose a specific group. Why? These individuals had to be high in in integrity. They had to be high on faith. They had to be willing to literally give their lives to tell this message of Jesus because they were that link between Jesus and us. They are the link. The unity had to be high. They had to work together. They had to be humble. They had to understand their role and willing to die for that. And so then we get this next group, and they, they too adopted the faith and the heart of those first converted, those first followers of Jesus. And they understood the importance of receiving these letters, receiving this teaching, from those eyewitnesses, that they would make copies of these things and ensure that the flock is cared for. And the ones that did that, the ones that were uh, tasked with this were the overseers or the elders. And notice what Peter says. He says, take care of them. They are under your care. Watch what he says. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2, the latter part, watching over them. And listen at what he says, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. So what is he saying here? He's saying, look, I'm, I, I, you, this role that you have as an elder, you don't do this because you must. You know, it's not like, you know, you get called to do this I, and God challenges you to do this because you must. He says, no, because you are willing. You have to understand 
the people he's dealing with here, the individuals that he's dealing with on this level, you know what they are? They are individuals that are willing. These are volunteers that have said, I want this. This is their desire. This is their motivation. Wow. Powerful in every way. But what separates those that must versus those that are willing? It's no different is if you go to a wedding and you you watch the two up at the altar and then the minister says, do you promise to love, to cherish and to honor and so forth? And they go, yeah, if I have to. <laughs> if someone says, yeah, if I have to versus I do, right? There is a problem, right? There is a problem. Now you say, well, if they go, well, they're saying they will, if they have to, they'll do it all. What does that tell you? That's not the person you want to marry. If they're going, well, if I have to, you want the one that says, I do, I am willing that that's their heart. And that's no different here. When, when Peter is writing, he goes, man, the individuals that will serve as elders, they're not in this role because they have to. They have a love for what they're doing. They are motivated from the heart. And again, this distinguishes these individual overseers from anyone else. It puts them in a category that is profound in every way when it comes to loyalty and love. And that's why there's such a high standard in the Bible for who can serve as an elder. You follow me? Thanks, Meg. Does that make sense, folks? Does that help you out there getting a perspective on who these people were? Extremely high in, in integrity, extremely high in character. And that's why we can have full confidence in these individuals recognizing who actually wrote these letters. So when someone comes to you and they start screaming about fraud, that they don't they have no clue on the integrity and the sincerity of heart and and the mechanisms of relationships that they had in the first century. Thank you, Mag. Thanks for lighting it up. They have no idea. And and they are and they're missing it all. Why? Because they don't take the time. Come on, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff, for lighting it up. They don't take the time to read the text and understand what is being written here in the biblical text to give us insight and clues that could not have been orchestrated. These could not have been orchestrated. There's too many players, too many players to orchestrate this in such a way that you would find these little nuggets scattered throughout the epistles that are written in the New Testament. So what does he say? Not because they must, because but because they are willing. And notice what they say, or what Peter says as God wants you to be. God's call here is that it's from the heart. It's your willingness. You, you have a willingness to do this, and it comes from the heart. This is very different than the old law. The old law was a must. You were born into the Levitical system, uh, uh, if you're a Levite, to be a priest. If you were born a Levite, you had to be a priest. It had nothing to do with your heart's desire. And this is why God spoke about David. I have no one like him. Why? His desire is for God. There was something in David that was uniquely different than everyone else. He had a desire within him. Come on, Daniel. He had a desire within him to honor God. And so when you look at this, he says, this is what God wants. This is why you know, the topic of slavery comes up. And, and when you read in Philemon, uh, when when Paul has Onesiphorus, thanks, Kim, thank you, and, and he sends him back to his owner, what does he say? He says, I could command you in the Lord, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make an appeal on love. Well, why is he saying this? Because what God wants from us is not a must do, but I am willing to do. There is a big difference if I have to. I mean, you know, imagine that. If he says about Onesiphorus, he says, well, if I have to let him go or if I have to treat him like a brother, is that what God wants? See, people don't understand. God is not here for just a list of do's and don'ts. 
God is here. He's calling us, should I say, to have a transformed heart. One that's not a must do, one that is I'm willing to do. Do you see the difference there? That's what God is calling us to. And so when people look at the biblical text, they're, the ones that are naysayers are always looking for a yes, a no, a white, a black, a yay, a nay. They're always looking for that. But what they And the reason they can't find it is because of what? God is calling us to have a willing heart. Come on, Queen Cato. Thank you for lighting it up. God wants a willing heart from us. He wants it from within. I'm going to change their heart. Remember in Ezekiel, they're not going to have a heart of stone anymore, right? He wants to break the callousness of stone. And what is that? That's the one that just, I have to versus I desire to. And that's the whole thing in a relationship, whether it be a marriage, right? Nobody wants to be married to someone that says, I have to love you. Nobody wants that. We want a genuineness from the heart. Well, different than God. God is transforming our hearts to be willing. And boy, what an amazing example here in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 and 2, in that the shepherds of the flock have a heart that is willing to and not a have to. Wow. You got to love that. So he lays this out. He says, but uh, this is what God wants you to be not pursuing what? And then he gets into this dishonest gain, right? You know, he talks again about the high level of integrity that is placed on the shepherds, the elders, the overseers, that they don't have this, this desire of dishonest gain. Well, what is the dishonest gain? You know, how there are people that always want their name on something. There are people that always want their name at the front of the class. There are people that always want to be recognized there are people that fall in love with the position rather than serving, right? There's constantly th these that want recognition, right? They want to know, it was me, it was me. He's addressing this. He said, they, they don't pursue dishonest gain. They're, they're, they're not in this for the fame. And the thing that I love about this, and this is where it, it really is convicting. You know, the naysayers about a lot of the New Testament writings, like they'll say, oh, well, look at Matthew or look at John. He didn't write it. He doesn't just tell us that in his writings. Why? Well, first of all, we get it from others on the outside that tell us they wrote it. But why is this? Because these people weren't arrogant like us. These people wouldn't sit down and write, says, this is me. I'm John. I'm this person of greatness. And I was there and I, 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 all through it. They don't do that. Why? Because they were humble servants of God. And the idea that they're writing the words of God and then that they're going to put their name, I did this, I, I, that is so contrary to who they were. It is so contrary. Look at Paul. When you read in Paul's letters, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, when he starts talking about uh, his own accolades, he literally writes, I can't believe I'm doing this. He says, I can't believe I'm even writing these things down about things that I've been through. He was um, he was just overwhelmed with the idea. Am I really talking about what I've been through and my credentials? Why? These people were extremely humble. They're not like the people we see in the world we live today. They're not like them at all. They did not want recognition. They weren't seeking this stuff for their own glory. They were humble servants of God. And I love what, what, what uh, Peter is writing here. He says, look, this is what God wants, not pursuing dis, dishonest gain. But notice what he says, but eager to do what? Eager to serve. Eager to serve. That's the individual's that we have that are witnesses of the eyewitnesses. These are the people that took the letters directly from Peter. These, this was the caliber of individuals that served the populace, that actually got it, and then they sat down, meticulously copied it, so that everyone could read the word of God. Why? Because they were eager to serve. Wow. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for the fire. Hey, if you're just joining, I want to welcome you to um, Grounded in His Promises. What do we do every day, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, if God should so allow, 
we jump into the word of God. We go verse by verse uh, and we go through it. It's a Bible study. It's not a sermon. It's a Bible study so that you can be grounded in his promises. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Kim. Light it up. And we've got great folks in here that are so supportive of the work that we're doing here. And if you like what you're hearing, if you're gaining insight about the text and you're encouraged, I ask that you encourage me simply by what? Clicking the follow. Click the follow. Let me know, hey, this is good. Why does that encourage me? One, it lets me know that there are folks out there that like this. In addition to that, it lets the algorithm know, hey, there are a lot of people out here that are looking for teaching like this. And it will look at your profile and then go find like-minded individuals out there. And we have a very diverse group that is here every morning. And so um, you help me out by that. And also, you can tap the screen. You tap the screen. It helps out with the likes. Again, the algorithm will go find people. There are folks that want to be on the team. We got 102 on the team right now. 102. That's awesome. You can be on the team. Or you can be a monthly subscriber. Maybe you go, man, I like this. I want to continue this, this ministry here that's on TikTok. Well, what is the goal here? My goal is to educate folks on the word of God. I feel like there's so much deception out there. There's so much bashing of the Bible, of God, of Christianity, and even the existence of Jesus. I am combating that by educating people on the word of God. And the larger this thing grows, the more we can combat the, um, the misguided intent to discredit the Bible and Jesus himself. I want that next generation to learn the word of God because so many people don't know the word and they may watch a podcast or a sermon here and there, but they're not in the word of God. And what we do here for an hour in the morning is we get into the word of God. That's what we do. And so I, I wanna spread this. So if you're out there, hey, come on in, support the team. Be a monthly subscriber. Get on the team. We got 102 on the team. Come join the team. Or if you're on the outside and you're scrolling, come on in. Come on in and click the follow. And let that lets me know, hey, man, I like this. Keep doing it. It encourages me, right? Okay, so here we go. We're in 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's continue. And as God wants us to be, what? Willing, eager to serve. Verse 3. Watch verse 3. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. Wow but being an example to the flock. Listen, the other characteristic, not lording it over. This is not a position where you just tell people what to do. No. What is the, the eagerness of it? You're eager to serve, not lording it over. Remember Jesus? Jesus says, we don't lead like the Gentiles, right? Lording it over. No, we are servants. So again, the people they chose to distribute these letters, the people they chose to be in leadership were individuals that were servants. These individuals were servants. They weren't caught up in the position. They weren't lording it over, telling people, do this, do that, do that, do this. No, they were servants. But I love what he says, not lording it over those entrusted to you. What does he say? Entrusted. You see what, 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 what was happening here in the first century? that the, the flock, the followers of Jesus were entrusted to the shepherds. The shepherds had a, a uh, um, they were given a trust to care for and, and to guide and to help those that were following Jesus. And notice what he says, they were entrusted to you. And then he says, but being an example to the flock. So what was the expectation was that these elders, these overseers, would be an example for everyone else. I mean, you're talking about some amazing individuals of faith, of spirituality, of righteousness, of humility and vulnerability. They were amazing individuals that, that served in an, in an incredible capacity. And I love the fact that we get two pieces here of eyewitness. We get Peter that was an eyewitness to them, to their character and who they were. And then you get them as an eyewitness to Peter and the authenticity of Peter's writings. And they knew him. Wow. So it, it all comes together. These, these were people that were high standards of moral values. They weren't corrupted individuals. They, they had a passion for truth and righteousness and humility. 
and they exemplified it. And many of them were killed. They, they were executed. And, and, it, and it's interesting, not just for their faith, but for the causes of their faith. You know, you, you, there's one thing, yes, when you're called to account, is Jesus Lord? And if you say no, okay, we'll let you go. If you say he is, we will kill you. That's one thing. But then there's another thing to lay down your life for those that you are serving as a leader that you lay down your life, you put your life and your family in harm's way to in the service of other people. And that's what they did. You notice when Jesus was being questioned, it wasn't just questioning him about his teaching, but they were asking about his followers as well. Why? Because they wanted to hunt him down. Yes, kill Jesus, but they wanted to hunt down his followers as well. And that was the same thing in the first century. So these leaders, these shepherds of the souls of the flock, they laid down their life for the members in their fellowship. That's incredible. You, 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 people just don't do that. They don't do that. And I know the naysayers, all oh, people die all the time. Yeah, they die for causes. That's true. These people are dying for causes. They're dying for and in, in, in many of the naysayers think they would die for a lie. People don't die for lies. But not only that, they're dying for one another. They are dying in the service of one another. Wow. High, high. And it's not just one. It's not just two. Hundreds and hundreds of individuals in the first century did this. And I just go, wow, wow. Blow away. So here we go eager to serve, not lording it over them, entrusted to you, <clears throat> but being examples to the flock. Verse 4 of 1 Peter chapter 5. And when the chief shepherd appears, who's that chief shepherd? Jesus. You will receive what? The crown of glory that will never fade away. Well, what's he getting at here in verse 4? He says, you know what? You won't be honored until Jesus comes back, right? He's, he's like the role that you have is not one where it looks like the crown of glory right now. He says, but when the chief shepherd comes back, then you will receive the crown of glory. Very, very powerful. Very, very, very powerful. First Peter chapter five. So now we get into verse five. Watch this. I love what he writes here because he's addressing, which is an age old challenge from every generation that has ever been on the face of the planet. He starts here in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. He says, in the same way. Now watch this. Thanks, Daniel. In the same way, you who are younger. Now listen at what he's, who's he speaking to right here? So he's really held up the, the elders, right? These are pastors. These are overseers of the flock. He holds them up. These generally are older individuals. That's just by the nature of the role. It takes experience. It takes longevity. It takes time. So these are, this is the older generation. Now in verse five of first Peter chapter five, he now speaks to the younger generation. And watch what he says here. And you tell me if this is not a reality for us in every generation. He says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to what? Your elders. Well, what is he getting at here? He's getting at the younger generation. You need to have respect for the elders, for the older generation. And this is a challenge. Why? Because there's a disconnect, a gap between generations in every generation. You think about today and you start talking about the new Gen Zs or the millennials. There is always a, a tension between these two. And well, what's that tension? Well, the younger generation can consider us old people as outdated, right? Oh, well, you don't know. And there's a lack of respect 
And, and, and so there's a gap that's there. It's kind of like you watch uh, folks that uh, uh, have babies, right? And they have a child and it's their first child. They really have a difficult time even letting their parents give them any advice on raising that baby. They have a difficult time with older folks who have raised kids listening to them. They rather go Google an article and God knows who wrote it and take advice from that over and above the older or the predecessors to them. They just, it, there, there's there, that tension has always been there. We have not invented that in our day and age. We haven't caused that in our day and age. And we always get this, this tension between generations as if we have caused it. It has no, it hasn't. It's always been there. It's in the first century. Listen at what Peter says. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. Well, why is he saying this? Because there's always been that tension. This, this unwillingness to uh, uh, learn, uh, to be trained by the generation before you. And then watch what he says, which really fixes the other side of the coin. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards what? One another. Well, what's the issue there? Humility. Humility. We've got to clothe ourselves with humility. And, and the problem that causes all this tension is a lack of humility. Uh, that, that's just, that's what we see here. And so the the um the call of the hour is to be humble the second piece to that if you're younger let the older generation help you let 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 the elders help you uh you 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 got to do that that that's god expects that and i know they go oh well you don't know you don't get it you no no we do know and get it We've been where you are. You can learn from us. You can learn from our mistakes and the things that we've done well. But there's a reluctancy to allow that younger generation to allow themselves to be trained. And, and, it, and it's not healthy. And you can say whatever you want to say. It was a problem in the first century. It's a problem in our century. And Peter addresses how to deal with it. There has to be humility on both sides. Humility on both sides. Humility on both sides doesn't mean the younger train the older. No, it doesn't. It still means the older will train the younger. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. It's kind of like when you, you had your kids and they were similar in age and you got in the car, who got in the front seat? The older, <laughs> you know, they, they get first dibs. That that's a that's a rite, a passage. Well, it was in our home. It was a rite of passage. And whenever my daughter wanted to sit in the front seat over and above my son, she had to get permission from my son. And he would, you know, and he was a great young man. He was like, okay, yeah, you can sit in the front. But she had to ask him. It's a rite of passage, you know. And <clears throat> it's just something about that. If you're ahead of the game then you can help those that are entering the game. That, that, that's just the way it is. And, and you don't, um, you know, you're, you're not all knowing. <laughs> so you need to learn. And, and it takes humility. And, and, and Peter is addressing this in 1 Peter chapter 5. And notice what he says. He quotes, he quotes Old Testament passages. Proverbs chapter 3, what does he say? God opposes the proud but shows favor to whom? The humble. God opposes the proud, wow, but shows favor to the humble. There it is. You know, you, if you're going to do anything, I, I, I suggest you get grounded in God's principles first before you make any decisions about your life. That, that's, that, that's just a, <laughs> that's a lesson that I've learned is biblically grounded and it will help you in your life. It will help you. Verse six. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's what? God's mighty hand, <clears throat> that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him 
because what? He cares for you. I love this passage, verse six, because notice what he says. He says, humble yourselves, right? <clears throat> humble yourselves under what? God's mighty hand. And, I, and he has to put this there because the teaching prior to this is hard. And, and that's, and he's saying, look, you need to humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. <clears throat> there is a, a willingness to trust God's way. And, and I love that he calls it God's mighty hand. In other words, God has the power to do what he's going to do in your life. And notice what he says, that he may lift you up in due time. I love this. Well, what is he getting at here? That there's a desire to be lifted up. There's a desire to be justified or made right. There's a de desire to be lifted up and say, yes, you've arrived. He says, but God will do that when? In due time. So in other words, hold on. <clears throat> you know, I talk to young ministers all the time. Stop trying to prove yourself. <clears throat> Stop trying to make a name for yourself. Stop trying to show uh, the older generation that you're better. You know, there's, there's this desire, this competitive nature that people get, that they want to show people I am somebody. You know, I am something. I'm a big deal. Stop it. God will raise you up in due time. God will put you in a position he wants you to be in in due time. But stop trying to, to be something instead of serving God. And, and, I, and I love this. He says, God will lift you up. God understands what you need and when you need it. <clears throat> That can be in any situation, maybe your job situation. You feel like, man, I'm here. I'm the one that's really doing all the work and I'm getting no recognition for this. Others are taking recognition for the things that I've done. God will lift you up in due time. God will lift you up. Yeah, but it's detrimental. It looks like I'm not the one and maybe I'll get uh, overlooked. Maybe you will, maybe you won't but God will lift you up in due time. And then watch what he says in verse seven, cast all your anxieties on him. See, what is it? I'm anxious. I'm fearful <clears throat> of different things, right? I'm going to get overlooked. Someone's going to get the credit over in me. I'm going to get blamed for this. Cast all your anxieties on him. Cast all your, now notice what he's saying here. I, I understand the anxiousness. I understand the challenges you are facing. I understand that. That's what he's saying. He says, I understand it. He says, cast all your anxieties on him. Now notice what he says, because he cares for you. You know, a lot of times when we're fearful and anxious, we think God is not there. When we're fearful and anxious, and, and God is not answering our prayers. God is not giving us what we want. We think God is not there. <clears throat> what does Peter say? He cares for you. Know that. Even in the midst of not getting an answer, God cares for you. That's the hard thing, right? Because you feel, you feel alone, right? You feel... Uh, um, overwhelmed, anxious, fear has got you. You're asking for something. It's not coming. The answers aren't there. You don't see a clear path. And, and so what do you think? You think somehow you, your sinful nature or God doesn't love you or you don't have enough faith. It's all Satan. That's what Satan wants to tell you. Satan wants to tell you God doesn't care, right? <clears throat> Peter says God cares. Yet yeah, are your prayers aligned in him? Yeah. God cares because he's got great compassion. We know God is not there. It's up to you to resolve your own problems. Well, that's how you live, Gus. That's that's not how we live. We, we entrust ourselves to God because we believe he is there. That's, that's, that's what we believe. Though we do not see him, we believe in him. I mean, that's, that's 1 Peter chapter 1. Though we have not seen him, we believe in him. Wow, that, 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 that's amazing, right? That's what we do. We struggle in our life 
because we believe in an unseen God. Very powerful. Thank you, Queen Cato. We have faith. That's right. We have faith. We wrestle in faith. We wrestle over the word of God. And God always reveals his truth to us, right? That's what he does. He doesn't answer prayers. I didn't. I, yeah, he, he answers them in his due time. Yeah, that's what he does. Yeah, you know, he doesn't answer prayers that are bad. I got I got a bunch of bad prayers that uh, I um, I'm so glad he didn't answer them on the back end. And I've I've got written documentation of it. I keep it with me. Um, I have a prayer journal that I've kept for uh, 17 years, I think it is now. And I write down just prayers here. I've had this for 17 years. And what I do is I just write down you know, something that's, you know, near and dear to me that I need. And then when God answers it, I, um, I highlight it or circle it. And, and I go through this journal, especially at the end of it every year, I go through it and look at all the prayers that I've had over the last 17 years. And it, and it's always hilarious to me, the prayers that I've asked God to do, the things I've asked God to do that he has not answered, <laughs> that he has said no to. That was his answer. And I was in great anguish over them. But now on the back end, when I look back on it, I'm like, I am so glad he didn't answer that one. Because if he had done what I wanted done, it would have been disastrous, absolutely disastrous. And so that's why I just go, man. <laughs> so it's it's very powerful and and that's why when i read this cast all your anxieties on him why because he cares for you i i have experienced that i have i have i have literally experienced that in the last 37 years of my life that my anxieties god cares about them and he answers those prayers according to his will and in every case, his will was better than mine. Every case, his will was better than mine. At the time, I many times I couldn't see it. Many times I, I couldn't even fathom what God was going to do. But on the back end, I look back and I go, wow, God, you, you're amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, and what you've you've done and and you know there's always things that are um you you think are here and now because you see them you know over a year ago i mean you go to my facebook page you'll see i was riding a bike all the way around philadelphia 180 miles praying 180 hours for the violence to stop here in philly and to raise some funds to to become an advocate to stop the violence because we have I think that year we had 250 teenagers shot and killed in Philadelphia. And so I'm begging God, surely God will move to raise this money. And this was a year ago, over a year ago. And, and he didn't do it. And I was like, man, surely this is a good thing that would be in the will of God. Well, now here we are a year later. And now God gave, I only wanted 180,000. God gave 750,000. <laughs> Not only did he give seven hundred fifty thousand, it freed up another hundred and fifty thousand, and then I got another hundred and fifty thousand that's coming in, and then we're waiting on another answer for a grant for one point three million dollars, all going to what? Stop the violence in Phil in Philadelphia. I was asking for one hundred and eighty thousand, and I was a little distraught that God didn't answer that prayer. And God's like, "You big dummy! I got something way bigger." that I'm about to do, but we had to get ourselves in a place ready to do that. And, and again, this is violence. You're not talking about things that are just, uh, you know, hard. These are people who've lost their lives, moms who have lost their children, dads who've lost their sons and daughters. And you would sit there and think, surely God's going to move. Well, God did move, but God said, wait. And he says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. God cares and God has moved in his timing. And we needed the right infrastructure in place to handle what God was about to give us. And he is, he's opened the floodgates. Now, now the real question is, 
are you willing to serve? Because now for, for me, it's like, okay, are you going to get the volunteers now that you have the resources to go and combat this? You really care about the violence? You know, you, you see people that talk about where is God with all the evil? Okay, we see a lot of evil here in Philadelphia. All right, people, all the naysayers that say, where is God? God has shown up. Are you willing to volunteer and help? God has provided the resources. Are you willing to get your hands dirty? See, this is the real issue. It always is the real issue. Are you willing? Very powerful. Very powerful. Let's be honest. God didn't give you that money. People did. Whatever you want to say, Gus, you could you could say whatever you want to say. I got written documentation that predates what you're talking about. And God moved powerfully. And God used to multiplied even what I was asking. You can say whatever you want to say. When I read the biblical text, when the temple was destroyed and Nehemiah was wanting to rebuild the temple, rebuild Jerusalem that was destroyed, where did God get the money? He prayed and God got the money from folks that didn't even believe in him. He got the money from people who didn't even believe in him to what? Rebuild the temple. There's biblical pre pre precedent for what I'm talking about. So you, you, you can reject it if you want. I'm just telling you it's in the scriptures. This is what we see in the scriptures. And so we, we pattern our lives behind the scriptures. And then when you pattern your life behind the scriptures and the same things happen, booyah, baby, it's confirmation that the word is true. I love it. Cast all your anxieties on him. Why, people? Because he cares about you. Be alert. Verse eight, and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, does what? Prowls around like a roaring lion looking to do what? Looking for someone to devour. What does he say? The bottom line the devil is like a lion. He prowls around looking to what? Devour you. How is he going to devour you? He's going to devour your faith. Your faith will be devoured by Satan. People lose faith because of Satan. Satan gets in and corrupts their thinking, corrupts their experience, uses bad experiences to confirm to them that there is no God or that God is not worth it or that God does not care about you. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion. His goal, ultimate goal, is not necessarily your death. His ultimate goal is that you do not believe in God, that you do not entrust yourself to God, because that, my friend, is the ultimate death. He wants you to reject God just as he did. And notice what he says, be alert. Peter says, be alert. This gentleman prowls around like a roaring lion. The devil prowls around. And what is he doing? He's looking for weakness. <clears throat> He's looking for signs of the herd to destroy it. Destroy what? Destroy the faith. Wow. Looking for someone to devour. Verse 9, resist him. What's the goal? Resisting. But what are you resisting? It's that thinking, right? It's that thinking of desires and thoughts. Desires and thoughts. That was the beginning of when you read in Genesis chapter 3, what was Eve's issue? Her desire for the fruit and her thinking about the fruit. And where did that come from? Satan used that against her to get her to disobey God. What is God, what is Satan doing today? He is going to deceive people through their desires and their thoughts. Their desires, which are pleasurable, what they want to spend on themselves, and they're thinking about that. That is what Satan is going to do. Why? He is out to devour sound thinking and faith. The Bible says resist him. Well, how do you resist the devil? You resist his desires that he's tempting in you, and you resist him by your thinking. Your thinking needs to imitate the thinking of Christ. You resist the devil by combating the devil's thinking with Christ-like thinking. You follow what I'm saying? You, you resist him by embracing the Lord's teachings, right? You get the Lord's teaching in your mind and you can resist the devil. The Lord's teaching is more powerful than the devil's teaching. You get me on that? So you speak the Lord's teaching in your mind to combat whatever is contrary 
to his teaching that comes from the devil. That's how you resist him. You resist him standing firm where? In the faith. My faith is based on what? The words of God. My faith is standing firm on what? The words of God. I hold to the teaching of Christ. And that's what I stand firm on. That's why this is called, I call myself grounded on his promises, grounded in his promises. That's where it's all about. Come on, Jeff. I love a hot dog. We have to be grounded in his promises. That's what this is all about. And without being grounded in his promises, you cannot resist the devil. Why? Because his reasoning at some point will make sense, just like it made sense to Eve. At some point, Cain, it made sense to kill his brother. At some point, Abraham was convinced, go sleep with the maidservant instead of my word. Wife, at some point, David decided it's okay to go sleep with my general's wife and then kill him. At some point, he decided to be persuaded by the devil's thinkings, which corrupted his desires. That, that's the, the simplest way to understand what we are up against. Our desires and thoughts must come under Christ. That's why the Bible says, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Whoa, Kim, are you kidding me? What is that? <laughs> Whoa. That was amazing. You get me on that? And this is how you, you, you settle yourself in the midst of this, guys. This is how you settle yourself in the midst of the challenges that we face, grounded in his promises. It's my website, groundedinhispromises.com. If you like what you're hearing, guys, go ahead, click and follow. Go ahead, come on in. If you're out there scrolling and you found this, come on in, click the follow. That lets me know, hey, you've been encouraged. And if you've been encouraged, encourage me. Let me know that you're with me, you like this, and you want this to keep going. If you want to be a part of the team, come on. We got 102 people on our team. That's it, man. I love it. I love it. I love it. Absolutely love it. You hit the screen, hit the likes, tells the algorithm, hey, there's a lot of people here that really like this. Come on out. If you want to support on a monthly basis, become a subscriber. Click the subscribers. Uh, you can uh, support this work. What do I want to do? I want to spread this message. I want this to get out to uh, as many people as possible, that they may hear the truth of who God is. Gus said it's a silly story. Amen. That's the way you view it. Amen. Verse eight, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers, I love this, the family of the believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Do you understand they had a worldwide movement? Do you understand they all understood each other? They were connected to each other. They were in fellowship with one another. They understood what each other was going through. And notice what he says. Believers throughout the world were undergoing the same kind of suffering. They were all being challenged. These people were being challenged in their faith. They were being persecuted. They were being executed. They were being hunted down, put in prison, but yet they remain unified and committed to one another unto God. That, my friend, is very powerful. Verse 10, and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory. What are we focused on? Remember, eternal glory. Eternal glory in Christ. After you have suffered, and I love what he says here, a little while. Wow. The perspective of suffering. He says, it's only a little while. He, he says, let me tell you something, you are suffering. And we know what was coming. Nero burning folks in the garden, being fed to the lions, executed by the gladiators. I mean, just terrible things. He says, you're only going to suffer for a little while. Will him himself restore you and make you strong? God will make you strong, firm and steadfast. Hang on in there. Firm and steadfast to him. Be the power forever and ever. And the church says, amen. And then watch what happens in verse 12. In verse 12, he says, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. Now, what does he say here? He says, with the help of who? Silas. Do you see? 
what he, you know, so the critics will say, oh, well, Peter didn't write first Peter. Why? Because they feel like it was too, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the Greek was phenomenal and the Greek was too well-written. Uh, Peter was a, um, you know, a fisherman. There's no way he could write Greek so wonderfully. And, and I think Silas uh, simply tells you, uh, yeah, that's why I'm here, because Silas was a well-respected leader, a well-respected leader, and he probably was a well-educated individual. And that's why Peter says, with the help of Silas, I write you this letter. Well, what is he saying? He's saying that, man, I couldn't, I'm not a great writer. You know, if you go to my profile page, and click my link and you go to uh, my website, you'll see my bio. And the bio is well-written. I I couldn't write that. I got help with that. So what did I do? I wrote it down as best as I can write. And then I had a good friend who got an MBA from Northwestern. She's brilliant in every way. She helped me restructure the sentences so that it came, it was really powerfully written. But it's me, it's all of me. It, you know, it wasn't like she forged it. No, she took what I gave her and then she helped me rewrite and rearrange things so that it came off much better. And I'm ever indebted for that kind of help. Why? Because I'm a terrible writer. I, I, but that doesn't mean it's fraudulent. It's me. And it's no different than what Peter did here. And that's why he says, Silas, help me. But the naysayers don't want to hear that. They don't, they, they just go, no, no, that's not who it is. But then think about it. Is this the only place Silas's name is written? No. You go to Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, there's a there's a real challenge in the first century church over this issue of circumcision and being saved. And they were saying, hey, in order to be saved, you had to become Jewish first. And then once you became Jewish, then you could become a Christian. And they were marking that with circumcision. And, and Peter... And the Apostle Paul, they were like, no, this is not right. This is not what Jesus taught. This is wrong. And so they go through this whole thing. And the elders, along with the apostles, James stands up as an elder, the brother of Jesus. And he says, no, that's not right. And then they, they say, this is how we're going to move forward. But when they deliver this message, guess who goes with them? In Acts chapter 15, Silas is there. And the Bible says that Silas went with the Apostle Paul and those guys to deliver it. Why? Because he was, it says Silas was a leader amongst the people. Silas was a leader amongst, and a well-respected leader amongst the people. And so he traveled with them. So when you read that, you just go, whoa, wait a minute. We also see Paul talking about Silas uh, and Timothy. They were co-workers with him and they helped him. This guy, Silas, was a powerful dude. He was one that even, he, he was a great leader. He was a leader of influence. But not only that, when there were controversial decisions being delivered, guess who accompanied the apostles? You would think that the apostles would have, you know, that's Trump, right? That's the big, big, big joker, right? If you play spades, right? No, they took Silas because the people respected Silas's view. This guy was was well respected amongst the people, so much so that he could validate the apostles and what was done there. And so you see that in Acts chapter 15, you see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Thessalonians 3, this name Silas comes up frequently. And that is a powerful, now what is that? He's an eyewitness to the eyewitnesses. Not an eyewitness necessarily of all of Jesus, we don't know. He could have been, he couldn't have been, we, we don't know. But what we do know is that he was an eyewitness to the Apostle Paul, to the Apostle Peter. He was an eyewitness to Mark. He was a traveling companion with Mark and a traveling companion with Timothy. This is powerful when you look at the text. So when you go back and you start reading, you know, you read 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 12. He says, with the help of Silas, he, he names this guy because this guy was so well-respected amongst the churches around the world, both in the Jewish con uh, converts to Christianity and the Gentiles. This guy, Silas, was like a stamp of approval on authenticating teachings that came from the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. That, my friend, is a powerful statement 
that we see here in first Peter chapter five. And you look at this and you go, wow. And he says, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as what? A faithful brother. Wow. That's, and he mentions him. You don't mention someone that nobody knows. He put the, he put a, a, a lot of stock in, hey man, you know this guy, Silas. I consider him a faithful brother. They all know. I have written you briefly, encourage you, and testify that this is true, the true grace of God. Stand, stand fast. Verse 13. Now watch what he says. She who is in Babylon, he's talking about the church. And Babylon is Jerusalem or Rome. That was how they disguised Rome. So Peter's in Rome, uh, chosen together with you, send you her greetings. Well, why is he writing it in code? Because they're looking to kill him. And so does, listen to what he says, my son Mark. Now here's Mark. He introduces Mark. Well, Mark is friends with Silas. Mark is friends with the apostle Peter. Mark is friends with the apostle Paul and Barnabas. Do you see these relationships? These are the relationships that are eyewitnesses to the writers of who wrote this. You, you can't you, you can't forge this and put Silas's name on it, put Mark's name on it, and then all of a sudden, you know, just send it out. This These individuals were known and would authenticate the reality of who's writing these things. And Mark was there from the early days when Peter was first arrested. Mark was there when, when he got a chance to witness uh, Paul's work. He was there with Luke. Mark and Luke were best of friends. That's why Luke's gospel, 80% of it is Mark's writings. But where did Mark get his writings from? Peter. Papias writes in the late first century that Mark sat down and wrote the gospel of Mark according to Peter's eyewitness testimony. He calls them Peter's memoirs. And here's Peter. And what does he call him? My son, Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. <laughs> Chapter five. <laughs> Chapter five, folks. What do you think? How was it? 